Welcome is indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richie. Good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. Breaking down news of the day, my contributor will be none other than Kyla Frank, Rebel HQ contributor and student organizing manager for Unpack National. It's going to be a great breakdown. Top story of the day. This one hits close to home, a professor at the University of West Georgia has shot and killed an 18 year old freshman student while she was sitting in her car. The reason why I say this hits close to home is because I have lectured and spoken at this very diverse institution. Let's put up the picture of the professor who was alleged to have committed this crime. His name is Richard Sigmund. Richard Sigmund looked like that when he was booked. Here's how he looks every day. That is Professor Sigmund before he turned into a gunman, allegedly. He is a business professor and also a business consultant. Let me give you background to this extreme and heartbreaking story. A university professor shot and killed a young woman who was sitting in a parked vehicle, according to the police. Professor Richard Sigmund of the University of West Georgia was arrested for a count of murder, a count of possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime, and three counts of aggravated assault. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Police identified the victim as the young 18 year old Anna Jones. Here's Ms. Jones. Now the family has a GoFundMe account set up for funeral arrangements connected to her death. Very sad, very tragic. The University of West Georgia is providing counseling services for those who need it. Faculty, students, staff included. Professor Sigmund allegedly got into an argument with a man at the local pizza restaurant and threatened to shoot him. He later went to a parking deck where he decided to fire into a parked vehicle killing the occupant, Miss Anna Jones. Carrollton police on Saturday, July 30th, 2022 at approximately 12, 27 AM. Officers responded to Tanner Medical Center regarding a female with a gunshot wound. Callers advised the incident occurred off Adamson Square in the courthouse parking deck. Preliminary information indicates that Professor Sigmund and another male got into a verbal altercation at the pizza place. The male notified security that Sigmund, the professor, threatened to shoot him. Security approached the professor, saw that he did in fact have a gun, and told the professor to exit the establishment. The professor then left walking toward the parking deck. Now, we don't know the motive. We don't know exactly why this professor decided to shoot into a parked car where a student was sitting, thus committing murder. We're not aware of these details, this story is still developing. Now, the police are saying maybe there's a motive that they are unaware of as of now. So the investigation is ongoing, police are asking if anyone has information to contact the Carrollton Police Department at 770-834-4451. 770-834-4451, everyone can remain anonymous. Now, I've had some conversations with students at that institution. Just not too long ago, I was lecturing on the campus dealing with race and diversity. Uh, The University of West Georgia happens to be a very diverse institution. Great leadership, I had a great time with the president of the college as well as his wife who is in academics as well. My heart and prayers are with the students, with the families that have been impacted with the faculty and staff of this institution. I'm not sure why the professor decided to do this. I don't know why he was armed at a pizza place. But I do know that he is going to face due process. I do know he's been arrested and now the criminal justice system will take over. And I do believe he will be held accountable for his actions. Once again, 
why was a gun necessary? What could have been maybe an argument, possibly a fight, transformed into a murder. All right, my dear sister, what are your thoughts on this? I first and foremost, I just cannot imagine like, you know, being a young student, you know, going for their first year of college and, you know, dying because our America has a gun problem. The fact that she died is because, yeah, there are way too many guns on our streets. And for the people who always say, you know, we need more guns, more guns, this is what the result of more guns. The more people who have guns, the more unruly behavior that we see, the more people are gonna be using these guns to you know, fight you know arguments. There was no reason why he should have even had that weapon in the first place and threatening people over something, what an order, something going wrong in a pizza shop. It's completely ridiculous. And so my heart and my condolences goes out to Miss Jones's families and her friends. And again, it's just like we need to get less, we need to get more guns off the streets. And this is again a direct result of the you know prevalence of gun culture in America. Yeah, and it seems as if people believe that guns are there to either uh, allow for an expression of anger um, mm. or to to make themselves come across as as Billy Badass. The reality is, uh, guns should only be used in the most dire of circumstances. And when something like this happens, and you have the most innocent of lives, an 18 year old freshman student at college, she's a college student. Being shot and killed by a professor at the institution, uh, it calls into question why do people think guns should be an everyday occurrence in the United States of America? All right. A judge, not just a regular judge, a chief judge, decided, according to the GBI, to rob somebody. Yeah, a judge robbed somebody. And then when confronted about the robbery, the judge then threatens violence against the person who says, you need to stop robbing me. Put up his picture full mass here, all right, only in Georgia. This is from a place called Tattnall County, Georgia. You're looking at the chief magistrate judge, Eddie Anderson, 70 years of age. Chief Judge Anderson has been charged with threatening and robbery. Let me give you the background. The GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, arrested a Southeast Georgia judge accused of threatening a person after stealing produce from their garden. There's more. The GBI arrested Tattano County Chief Magistrate Judge Eddie Anderson on Monday. He's charged with terroristic threats and violation of oath by a public officer. The GBI said the incident reportedly happened on June 22nd. Tattano County Sheriff Kyle Sapp requested the GBI investigate the judge after a person came forward. Let's put up a picture of the sheriff. So here's what's happening so far. The sheriff gets a credible complaint that the chief magistrate judge of that county is committing theft, is committing robbery. Instead of investigating the judge himself because of their close relationship, he decides to call in the state investigative agency known as the GBI. The GBI, they then conduct their investigation. and They find that not only did this judge um, likely commit robbery, but also decided to threaten the individuals who own the garden. The homeowner allegedly called Anderson to discuss the garden thefts. That's when the GBI said Judge Anderson made violent threats in the presence of other witnesses. Well, I mean, hell, he's a chief judge. Anderson, the judge, then turned himself in and was released on a signature bond according to the GBI. The GBI said the investigation is complete and will be given to prosecutors. Now, this is a nuance for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation that people need to be aware of. The GBI, they do not indict, they do not prosecute. They basically do investigations and they will relay that information directly to the prosecuting authority. So that's how they typically do it. So this is not abnormal for them to say we have concluded the investigation and we're now turning over our findings 
to the prosecutor. It will be interesting to know because a lot of dynamics here. Number one, when the judge got arrested, it was a judge appointed by this judge that gave him a signature bond, <laughs> number one. Number two, another dynamic that's interesting is the fact that even though this has been on record as far as a judge perhaps committing robbery, there does not seem to be a push in the local community for this chief judge to resign. Even though the actions are substantial enough where the sheriff believed there was merit to the accusation, the GBI believed there was merit to the accusation. And I think now the prosecution is going to believe there is merit to the accusation that this judge in fact committed robbery and also decided to threaten physical harm against the individual he robbed. Quite fascinating, but once again, this gives you a glimpse into let's say rural town corruption. Do you think this was the judge's first time utilizing his position, his privilege, his authority to do something extreme? I don't think so, he's 70 years of age. I think he's been doing this for a long time. I think he was shocked that anybody decided to hold him accountable. All right, thoughts? You know, absolutely disgusting. He needs to be fired immediately. But I'm just, this man had so much energy to threaten someone. He could have taken all that energy and gone to the store and got his own groceries and his own <laughs> produce. All that power you have, you can ask somebody to go get you some fruit from the, the, the store. And it's just, you made a really good point. Like, this is probably not the first time he has abused and misused his power and authority. And it's, again, I, I would like to see more action from the community. But most importantly, action from those people who are in positions of power to make this man resign or fire him and disbar him from his position. That is absolutely ridiculous and it should have never escalated to that point. Yeah, we're gonna follow this story because it will be interesting to see exactly how this unfolds given the fact that he is the chief magistrate judge of that jurisdiction. All right. Matt Gates, Roger Stone caught on a hot mic moment discussing their own corruption. Here it is. Uh, I'm gonna go, I'll go down hard though. I'll well, fight it right to the bitter end. Yeah, but I, I don't think it's gonna go down at all at the end of the day. Well, we'll see. Three, we're three weeks from trial. Yeah. I mean, uh, I may have to appeal to the big man because I got, it's the District of Columbia. We surveyed 120 jurors, 90 of them know who I am and they hate my guts, voluntarily. I don't think the big guy can let you go. This was back in 2019, Matt Gates is talking to Roger Stone. Roger Stone is about to go to trial because he's corrupt as hell. Matt Gates was reassuring him, hey buddy, the big guy is not going to let you go down for this. Roger Stone saying that he's not going to fold. Let me give you the irony of this. At the time of this recording, Matt Gates was on the committee charged with investigating Donald Trump for the misuse of pardons. Let that sink in. During the time of this recording, Matt Gates, the man who is basically relaying to Roger Stone, it will be okay, the big guy will take care of you. He was on the committee in charge of investigating Donald Trump for the misuse of pardons. Let me give you some background to this. Stone was convicted on seven felony counts that November. After that recording, he got convicted, he knew he was going down and sentenced to 40 months in prison. But Trump, who publicly praised Stone for not flipping on him, commuted his prison sentence before it began and eventually pardoned him, just as Matt Gates said he would do in that hot mic conversation. You gotta think about this, wrap your head around the corruption here. It is so informal. There's no special meeting, there's no boardroom, there's no cryptic conversation. They're just talking about their corruption openly because this is how normative corruption is for them. And Matt Gates is reassuring Roger Stone, hey buddy, don't worry about it. The big guy, he has you, he's not gonna let you go down for this. While Matt Gates is serving on the committee to investigate Donald Trump 
for criminally misusing the pardon power. There's more. Mueller's report, remember that? Mueller's report said it was possible that Trump, in fact, had both lied to investigators about his contacts with Stone and was aware Stone might provide damaging testimony against him if he chose to cooperate with prosecutors. At one point, at one point, Stone told Gates he would not fold. Here it is. Well, we shall see. I won't fold that. You can bet. There he tried that. Huh? And, and, and the boss still has a very favorable. He sends that message from time to time. He knows. It would have been easy to make this go away, but I couldn't live with myself. These are your trusted public servants, your leaders of the conservative movement, those who tell you it's all about America first. But every time we see it is about themselves first. Let me give you background to the recording. At an event at a Trump property in October, Representative Matt Gates predicted that Stone will be found guilty at his trial in Washington the following month but would not do a day in prison. Gates was apparently unaware they were being recorded by documentary filmmakers following Stone, whom special counsel Robert S. Mueller III had charged with obstruction of a congressional investigation. The 25 minute recording was captured by a microphone that Stone was wearing. He taped his own damn conversation, okay? He was wearing a microphone on his lapel for a Danish film crew, which was making a feature length documentary on the veteran Republican operative. The filmmakers allowed Washington Post reporters to review their footage in advance of the release of their film, A Storm Foretold, which is expected later this year. Once again, the irony, Gates, Matt Gates is a member of the House Judiciary Committee. At the time of the conversation, the committee was investigating whether Trump might have obstructed justice by floating possible pardons to Stone and other allies who were swept up in Mueller's investigation of Russia's interference in the 2016 election. So there's a statement from the Gates camp. In a statement to the Post, Gates office said he was not speaking on Trump's behalf during the pardon discussion with Stone. His remarks about secret portions of the Mueller report were not specific enough to violate the terms under which he had been permitted to view them, the statement said. It is also said the conversation was illegally recorded. There we go again, illegally recorded style over substance under Florida law. Each participant in a discussion must consent for it to be recorded, provided they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. The director of the film said the congressman's remark about recording devices suggested he had no such expectation. Uh, It was an open room, no expectation of privacy there. There's no criminal issue um, as far as we can tell. Fascinating dynamics here, okay? This is how they do it. It gives you an opportunity to review who they are behind the microphone, outside of the ready view of the camera. They thought. They were off record, they thought they were just talking. They already told you what was going to happen before it happened. Matt Gates was was right, it went down exactly as he said. All right, Kyla thoughts on this. What's the most frustrating part about all of this is that, you know, especially as a young person, we are taught that our government has a system of checks and balances that, you know, would hold our government accountable, would weed out corruption, and that couldn't be further from the truth. And what's It's just really hard to see all these things like unfold. And then our government is surprised that the American people, that young people have lost all types of faith for our government. 
because this corruption continues to happen and you you better be sure that these aren't the only people, you know, participating in the corruption in our government. And so I feel like yeah, like the government's a complete sham if they can't even, you know, hold the people who are supposed to hold other people accountable accountable. And I'm just I'm completely tired and it just makes me want to just throw the whole system away because clearly it's not operating how it's supposed to operate. It's not operating in good faith and yeah, like I'm not surprised that more and more people um, more and more generations are again are losing faith in our government. Yeah, and the irony cannot be overstated here. Mm. Matt Gates is on the committee to investigate actions that he is a part of himself. That's how insane this is. But it shows you their corruption knows no bounds. All right, we have more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. Welcome back, we got a lot of show, all right? Let me read some of these comments before I go to the comments. Uh, don't forget about the watch list, add the watch list to your watch list. Join the big homie J.R. Jackson, live weekdays, 12 p.m. Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Follow facebook.com forward slash watch list TYT. And also make sure you subscribe at youtube.com forward slash watch list TYT, an amazing show. All right, uh, Nostra Science says, an angry aggressive, <clears throat> excuse me, an angry aggressive thief of a judge in the South. I can guess a few very orange veggie related reasons as to why. Bada boom. Joe says, Matt Gates be like, if I'm not locked up for trafficking underage girls, you ain't got nothing to worry about, my dude. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's probably true, actually. David Morris, I'm going to say again. This is the issue with guns. They allow malicious cowards way too much power. Talking about talking about the professor uh, that shot and killed a student. OG Sama says, wonder if the man ever convicted anyone for stealing before. Yeah. All right. Um, Farda uh, Farda Masses says they sound like want to be good fellas. They do. Hey, who talked to the big guy? Gonna talk to the big guy. I'm gonna talk to the big guy. C. Michael Henson, thank you, C. Michael. Where do I sound up to be on the team that is investigating Matt Gates? Stuff just seems so obvious to me, and I'm not even fully paying attention. <laughs> we got the mob in Congress, y'all. That is so true. You you can ha be halfway paying attention and say, damn, he's supposed to be in jail. All right. Okay, Twitch, real quick. Um, the big guy, they talk about 45 like he's eight. <laughs> right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're going to feel great. Back off! I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Yes, move her out the way, please. This be great. We got kids and babies over here. Move. Oh, she's spitting. I got it all on camera. I got more video. This is a throwback, Karen. She's still at large. Here's more. I have called PD. They're on their way. She's the only which I is. I talked. Do you see call. how easy it is to get the phlegm out? It's a lesson. I have it on video. So it's okay. called leave. Get him. your phlegm out because that's where you're getting the fat out. And the fat holds the toxins and the f***ing viruses. Ma'am? You think I'm a, just yeah. having fun being a stupid blonde? Would you like to go? Yeah, I just decided. Please speak to us. That means she is doing fine. You guys are so dumb. 
Oh my God. The Karenicity in this one runs deep. Let's put up a picture full mass here. All right, this is full throttle Karenicity 101. Uh, this particular Karen was escorted out of this California Walmart. However, we do not have any indication that she was in fact arrested for the actions of that day. So let me say this very clearly, individuals who work, they come to work, they have to deal with a lot of different personalities. They have to deal with people that are upset about not being able to find a product or maybe the line taking too long. Under no circumstances does that warrant an individual to then decide to spit on an employee at all, period. Never should happen, okay? But because they believe their status is somehow greater than others, because these Karens believe that they are empowered to act this way toward other human beings, that will always land them a spot right here on Indisputable. Why? Because we provide a mirror, a mirror for reflection for those who accept it, a mirror for correction as well. All right, dear sister, what are your thoughts here? No, this woman is absolutely disgusting. She needs to be put in a jail cell and also re-enrolled in a science class because she was talking so much nonsense. I really couldn't even keep up with that. But yeah, like it's just ridiculous. Over twenty-two dollars, like. That is not normal behavior. You know what you do in that situation? You take some things out of your cart, you put it back, and then you pay for your, your, your items, and then you leave the store. And I just feel so bad for that employee. Again, raise the wage. Um, we, we, they need to get paid a lot more to deal with people like that. This woman needs to be in jail. This woman needs another science class. She needs a lot. This woman is a whole train wreck. And yeah. so, I, again, I just feel bad for the employees and anybody who had to be in that facility and have to experience what that, um, you know, dastardly Karen was putting out in the, in the uh, putting out there. Because again, despicable. Well, Kyla, if you thought that was something, I got something for you. <laughs> Double dose. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're going to feel free. Back off! I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. What can I say here? What can I say? World star. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a couple of things here. I typically root for the little guy, all right? Um, they have heart. But when you literally ask for an ass whooping, and then you wear one, that's not how it's supposed to go. But I will give this particular male Karen at least one point. Because if you notice during this, whatever the hell just happened, his level of trash talking remained constant throughout the entire ordeal. That's not easy to do once you just had your behind handed to you. His level of trash talking remained constant. It didn't go up, it didn't go down, it remained the exact same. So I guess there's something there. Um, there you go, all right? <laughs> this was at the end of this, Kyla, I was saying, all right, so he's like, let me at him, let me at him. Well, he, he was just there. You all were just connected physically, <laughs> all right? If, if, if you couldn't do anything then, I don't think you're going to do something the second time. I think you need to be thankful 
to black Jesus that a security guard or whoever he was was there standing in the way of round two. That's just my take on it. Yeah, um, he said like, you know, he was like, oh, big man going after the little man. That was so much conviction. I kind of felt bad for him. I felt a lot of pity for this guy. Like the Napoleon complex was strong in him. Again, all bark with no bite. But at least he was consistent. At least he was consistent with his yelling. But um, after that, L, I, I would have just walked out and left. You know, yeah. forget about my order. Give me a refund. You know, I'm gonna take the L and go home back to my little house. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely ridiculous. And I don't think the um, so-called big guy was actually trying to hurt the other guy. I think he was, you know, responding to the invitation for combat. All right. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. Welcome back, a lot of show left, thank you for remaining, all right? Uh, Petition, great news, we have more endorsers for our $18 minimum wage petition calling for Governor Newsom to hold a special election so working people in California can have a living wage, all right? So we're proud to say that people like Representative Eric Swalwell, Representative Rokana, and many others have signed on the petition, you can too. Sign the petition, tyt.com, CA minimum wage, tyt.com forward slash CA minimum wage. All right, Conrad Williams says, um, small wonder that prospective employees don't wanna take relatively low paying jobs and be exposed to this kind of behavior. That's right. All right, infantry chef. I guess the Happy Meal wasn't available for uh, McCarran. Yeah, you too. Um, Mia Mia Allen says, I give them one thing. They're consistent. Talking about the Karens. C. Michael Henson, thank you, C. Michael. Somebody get Marjorie Taylor Greene's cousin out of this Walmart. Then again, it could have been Marjorie Taylor Greene herself in disguise, an insult to smart blondes. Okay. Thank you again, C. Michael. If I was a security guard, I would have moved out of the way and let him get his behind handed to him. Mm. All right. Uh, Dissident PM says, man, Walmart is nothing if not entertaining. Yeah. All right. Here's an update to a story. Remember the powerful councilwoman who literally ran over a man, kept going, who decided not to stop, check, and report, okay? Well, there's an update. Let me remind you of the action of this councilwoman. Here it is. Okay? See there? There's a man on a bicycle, she just hit, kept going, no brake light, no nothing. That happened. And there was no penalty, at least immediately. Now her father is the executive of the county. We're talking about a powerful family, okay? Let me give you background to this before I do that. Let's put up her picture full mass, remind you of the Jersey City Councilwoman, Amy DeGees, okay? Amy decided to hit a person. She is from the West District area and later that day, hours later, She walked in to report the crash. Now this happened early in the morning. Later that day, she decided to report the crash. This was six hours later, she then reported the crash. And I'm gonna give you some background as to why she eventually reported this crash. Where by the way, the guy could be dead, all right? He could be dead right now, thankfully he is not. So here's video from the councilwoman going to the police station to report her own hit and run later that day. Here it is. Okay. All right. Once again, let's put up a picture of the councilwoman in question, Amy DeGees. Now, why did this councilwoman take so long to report the incident? Well, apparently, the day after the crash, A source close to the councilwoman told the Jersey Journal that she in fact struck her head. And when she realized what had occurred, she reported it to the police 
a claim that now appears to be completely false. So here's what the good councilwoman wants us to believe. She wants us to believe that she was driving at about, let's say, 8 a.m. in the morning, all right, going to work. She strikes a person on a bicycle, I mean, and strikes him hard, okay? He goes up and down her vehicle. She does not hit her brakes. Six hours later, she realizes um, I may have hit somebody and I decided to leave the scene of the crime. So let me go to the police station to cover my ass. I mean to report that this thing happened. And and obviously I didn't report it immediately because woe is me, I hit my head. I mean, come on guys, make sense, there's more. A video from November surfaced where the councilwoman desperately tried to convince a police officer not to tow her car. Here it is. Your vehicle, I take it. Okay. We got bad news. Number one, you got hit by a, a tractor trailer making the turn, partially because you're in the no stopping, no standing zone. Okay. I'll get you. That's okay. I'll get you a case number. I'm going to generate a report. The guy stopped. I have all his info. So. Uh, um, the other part is that your car has been unregistered since 2019. So it's going to have to be impounded until you register it and then you can pick it up. I have yeah. um, uh, a family member that said, officer, I have a card on me. If there's any way I can have a ticket instead, please. I have to go back to work. I'm a teacher at Hudson County Schools of Technology. I wish there was more I could do. It's been unregistered since 2019. There's, there's nothing. It has to be it. Remain in town. So if... I appreciate that. But it's endorsed it's, by the police in Jersey City. I'm a councilwoman. I, I'm sorry. There's, there's nothing else that I could do. You see, she was utilizing her power, her influence, her government authority in order to try to get herself out of a damn towing situation. Put up a picture again. So here's what you just saw in front of you. That councilwoman, the same one who decided to hit a citizen and keep going to avoid consequences for her expired registration. Who in the hell drives with expired registration anyway? And is a whole council member, she does. To avoid the consequences, she offered to show the officer her PBA card. Told the cop that she was a Jersey city council member endorsed by the local police union. And after the fact, phoned John Allen, a confidant to the mayor to help her, her car ended up being towed anyway. The reason behind the delay in reporting the crime may have been because she wanted to try to exercise her, let's say, special privileges as a councilwoman with many connections. As we know, her father is the executive of the county in which she serves. Although all of this information has been unraveled, it has been exposed, it is in the front. The councilwoman refuses, has no intention of stepping down from her seat, facing calls for resignation after a hit and run accident 10 days ago. Jersey City Councilwoman Amy DeGees, through a spokesman, says she, and I quote, will not resign. And plans to complete her full term and continue in public service. Let's look at the victim. Remember, there's a victim here, okay? The person she hit, his name is Andy Black. Andy Black is recovering and now has lost wages. Remember, Mr. Black was delivering food, all right? That's what he was doing. He was on his job when the councilwoman hit him. He has a GoFundMe account. Uh, because uh, the councilwoman is not going to provide any relief, according to the report, no relief for Mr. Black while he recovers. All right, there you have it. Okay, Ms. Frank, thoughts here. First and foremost, I'm surprised she wasn't charged with a felony because when you do a hit and run in New Jersey and you flee the scene, 
you're supposed to be charged with a felony. And so it's clear that she's using her position and her privilege to skirt the law. And that is a direct violation to serving the public that she so wants to you know, throw out there and claim that she's doing. And so I think we're just seeing like a trend of like people in power steadily abusing their positions over and over again. And my question is, when is that going to be enough for the public, you know what I'm saying? Like, when are you know people who actually are legitimately trying to serve the public going to say this is this kind of practice needs to stop? Because it is ridiculous that she can hit a man with her car, like he's not only like bodily injuries, but losing wages because of her actions. And she's supposed to like continue with her, you know, her her job and her position. Absolutely not. And I hope that you know. Um, there's more backlash, public backlash. But I also just hope again that she is held to the um, accountable to the full extent of the law and thrown into prison and actually serves um, the time that she needs to do in prison. Yeah, well, no apology from the councilwoman. Um, I'm sure daddy has come in and he's cleaned up as much as he could. There's an attorney obviously on record. We will see how this case unfolds, but I would not hold my breath that actual justice will be served. Okay, I've seen a lot in my life, but damn it, Airbnb renting out slave cabins, this is a first, here it is. This is not okay in the least bit. And I know there's gonna be somebody that says, "Oh, you're looking for controversy where it doesn't exist. No, this is an 1830s slave cabin that is up on Airbnb as a, as a bed and breakfast. How do I know that this is slave quarters other than just using my eyes and looking at it? Well, they say it in the listing, this particular structure, the Panther Burn Cabin is an 1830s slave cabin from the Panther Burn Plantation. How is this okay in somebody's mind to, to rent this out? A place where human beings were kept as slaves. Rent this out as a bed and breakfast. Here it is, that's it right there, the slave quarters next to the big house. It's in uh, Greenville, Mississippi, that's, that's the host, Brad, the super host. But what really kills me is reviews, memorable, highly recommend watching the sunset. We stayed in the sharecropper cabin and ate in the main house, enjoyed everything about our stay, the cottage, the history, the tour, the breakfast and all was great. We stayed in the cabin and it was historic, but elegant. A slave cabin is elegant. What a delightful place to step into history, Southern hospitality and stay a night or two. Cool spot, way better than a hotel. Maybe you're thinking, okay, maybe this will give people insight on how enslaved people had to live, their living conditions. No, not at all. Clawfoot tub, running water, tile, you know, nice lighting fixtures, water, towels, dresser. The history of slavery in this country is constantly denied and now it's being mocked by being turned into a luxurious vacation spot. For those of you who will watch this segment and not get it, let me try to help you. There should be no romanticizing of slavery in America. You see, nobody would consider this if it was, let's say, an invite to a remake of the Holocaust or gas chamber or torture chamber. But see, that's what slave cabins were. It was torture. Need I remind you that those who were enslaved were not only brutally beaten, they were raped, they were molested, they were murdered. And now you have an enterprise, an industry, a group of individuals throughout this country who are making light of this historical reality. It gets deeper. Winton Yates, an entertainment and civil rights attorney recently exposed this since remove Airbnb listing on TikTok, okay? The listing featured in Yates TikTok has since been taken down from Airbnb. But a quick search actually reveals there are many others just like it, all of whom openly state that slavery related histories of their properties are there. Let's put up some of the pictures, okay? There's this tiny home cottage on a Georgia plantation named after a slave who lived there, okay? 
Marquette. Let's go to New Orleans. There's this suite where enslaved people once lived. They're calling it a private suite, bath overlooking a courtyard theme. There's more. This mansion with, as they say, newly renovated guest rooms to the back of the house that once served as slave quarters. This is actually hosted by a black male. This is a restored haunted former slave cottage in the heart of New Orleans. There it is. Let's talk about these cabins. In the 1800s, thousands of slave quarters and cabins were built on the site of plantations around the country. In them, children and adults died of disease, mistreatment and overwork. Plantations were graveyards and places of unfathomable human misery where families were torn apart. Some have referred to those southern plantations um, as America's Auschwitz, referencing one of the most well known Holocaust concentration camps known. Now, let me come back to reality on this, okay? I know there are some who will say, well, this is private enterprise. Airbnb has nothing to do with this. Airbnb is not in charge of individuals who decide to place their properties for listing. Well, kind of. Airbnb does have the ability to regulate properties. They can say no, they can deplatform a property as they choose. But let's put that aside. Just as these private homeowners or private property owners are exercising their right to rent out their property, I'm exercising mine. I'm exercising my freedom of speech, my right to say when something is wrong. And so if we're talking about rights, I'm well within mine and they can be well within theirs. I'm saying point blank period, this should not stand without significant ridicule in this nation. This is not funny, this is not a game, slavery was not romantic, it did not have a great view. We're not talking about a sunset, we're talking about children raped. Men and women destroyed, individuals murdered, and human beings who are owned. Never forget that. All right, Kyla, thoughts here. Absolutely deplorable. And the truth of the matter is, is that black pain and trauma and death is not taken seriously in America. And we see it in so many different aspects of you know the lives of black people when it comes to like Medicare, um, you know, hospitals and medical malpractice. When it comes to the criminal justice system, where you know black people are overly charged and more likely to be killed by police, we see it time and time again. We have the Biden administration steadily trying to fund more police, um, give more funding to police, and it's just like, when does it stop? When are you truly going to be care about you know the lives? And the issues that black people face in this country. And you made a really good comparison. Like we would not see these type of things happening on, you know, the um, concentration camps where Jewish people were held. So why the hell are we doing that where, you know, black people were murdered, uh, raped, hanged, um, you know, totally dehumanized? It's ridiculous to me. And I like dare anybody to, to, to try to like, you know, combat what I'm saying right now. Like, you cannot tell me, my ancestors, or the millions of people who were sacrificed for the building of this country and the building of this economy that this should be, this kind of practice should be allowed. It's disgusting. Yeah, we're gonna stay on top of it. Obviously, there are more than what we presented during the segment. We just want people to get some get right juice, all right? Take this as an opportunity to reflect and correct yourselves, or you will be exposed on Indisputable. We got more on the other side, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We got a lot of show left. Let me remind you of primary coverage. That's tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Another round of primary elections is upon us with the establishment and progressives facing off on Tuesday, August 2nd. Tune in at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Catch the crew right here. Watch on tyt.com forward slash live, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. All right. Okay. Lynn says, did she have to wait six hours in order to sober up? That was my thought initially. Mm. Still may be true, all right? Uh, Mika C, the Silverhead Dragon. I'm all for allowing these places use a slave quarters as a BNB as long as they're kept in the original condition. No plumbing, no electric, no appliances, no heat, AC, etc. 
make it a learning opportunity. And if they break any of the rules, they can be whipped. Do you really want to learn what slavery was really like? Of course not, right? They want to romanticize it, okay? That's all they want to do. Uh, and it hurts the, the true history of what we overcame in this nation. And if we don't speak up, who will, right? All right, agnostic sister says, Amy makes her own rules, obviously. There you go. All right, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene um, says that murder is in fact legal. Here it is. You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face. It's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math, so I'm gonna say amen. Listen, I think there is always a pro Second Amendment argument. I, as a matter of fact, I have never seen an argument to take away the Second Amendment or to pass more gun control. The reality is murder is legal and there is already plenty of gun control in place. Every single time we see these shootings happen, there's so much more to the story. We want to know how, what kind of drug abuse is going on with that person? What kind of um, psychotropic medications are they on and are those making in effect, as well as what is their home life like and what are their parents doing? The other questions are, where do they get these guns and, and why weren't the checks and balances that are already legal, why didn't they stop it? But the real reality is guns, I mean, schools are gun-free zones and many places are gun-free zones and that leaves every single person unsafe because you can't defend yourself. No Marge, murder is not legal. And if you do just a quick Google search, you will see that gun free zones have less gun violence and overall violence than other zones. Just a simple fact. But it's interesting how individuals like Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene will look for every other angle rather than a policy angle. What kind of household did they come from? What did the parents do? All right, what, what kind of drugs were they on? All right, here's the reality, Congresswoman. The reason why you want us to focus on these other elements is because you don't have to move, you don't have to work. You don't have to create policy to deal with a family issue. You don't have to be thoughtful about policy to deal with an issue inside of the home. You can just talk about it. But when we actually get to a place of policy, for example, a gunman being able to get his hands on a weapon where his daddy had to sign for it because he was 18. That's a policy issue that can be solved by a policy remedy. Meaning lawmakers have to come to the table and admit they were wrong. This was a bad policy, even though they said if mama or daddy signs off on it, it's okay for the 18 year old to have this weapon. Bad policy. It's hypocritical to say on one hand, we know the 18 year old should not have this gun, but let's make a way for them to have it no matter what. Ridiculous. All right, uh, Ms. Frank thoughts on Marjorie Taylor Greene. I just want her to sit down with the families of the victims of gun violence and say that murder is legal. We covered a story earlier in this segment when you know this, um, you know, Miss Jones, college freshman who was shot and killed by her professor, like or by a professor from the school that she went to, was that murder legal, Marjorie? And so it's just like again, like trying to find any angle to not really address the core issue at hand. The fact that is that you know we have too many guns in this country. There's not enough policy decisions, like you were saying, that actually protect the lives of Americans. And instead of actually addressing that, you want to say murder is legal makes no sense whatsoever. I I know why she's a congresswoman, but I just don't really understand it. Like I <laughs> it, it's it's frustrating and it just blows my freaking mind. Well obviously Marjorie Taylor Greene is for the purge. Um mm. we'll continue to follow this congresswoman because she obviously is dangerous. Always a pleasure having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you, check out your great work. 
Most definitely. So you guys know I'm a contributor on Rebel HQ. So definitely go over to my playlist and check me out. But I want everyone right now to pull out their phones. I know you, some of you might be watching right now. Go to Let's Unpack on Twitter. That's L-E-T-S. UNPAC on Twitter. We are launching our campaign tomorrow. We understand that the you know fight for voting rights has left the federal level, but is still active in the states. And so we are mobilizing young people across this country to continue to fight for our rights and our freedoms to vote. So please check us out on, on Twitter and on Instagram at UN-PAC. Since day one, I told you this, I'm, I'm going to echo it again. Super proud of you, my dear sister. Thank you. All right, we got more on the other side. The bullpen is next, stick and stay. Welcome back, we got a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. B says, murder is legal, abortion equals murder. So then abortion is legal, yes, you see how that works? Thank you, Marjorie Taylor Greene, I knew you'd come in handy someday. Uh, Alicia says, I just got stupider. From listening to Marjorie Taylor Greene. C. Michael Henson, Dr. Richard, you need a new segment name. What in the Marjorie Taylor Greene hell? That's right. Moan Dragon. Did MG just argue that abortion is legal? Robert, Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene solve everything with a gun. Yeah. Um, Hunger Games underscore 1989. If Marjorie is for the purge, who is going to take Greene out? That is so wrong. That is so wrong. Right? I do not condone violence of any kind. Except for self-defense, obviously. Right? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Fascinating. In the bullpen today, we have Dr. James Rogers, Republican. Congressional candidate for the 30th district in the state of Texas. He has a long and involved career in education as well as education leadership. We're glad to have the good doctor on the program, Dr. Rogers. Welcome to Indisputable. Pleasure to be here, absolutely. All right, today we're going to chop it up about school choice. <clears throat> Obviously, this is something near and dear to your heart because of your background in education. I'm not going to presume what you know or believe about school choice and how it impacts the larger community. So if you would give us your sentiment and I will then opine. Absolutely, and I'm gonna try and return the favor, but not presupposing about you or uh, engaging in anything that is a pure civil discourse. Cuz I think Good. we can find some common ground here. Uh, the, current, the current state of public education uh, does not meet the modern and diverse needs of this country. That's, that's just the plain truth. We have a Frankenstein system that is patched together from different eras that cost so much money to maintain that it takes away and drains money away from where it should be going, which is students and teachers. And most importantly to me is the unequal outcomes that we just accept as part of the system. We know that early education favors uh, females over males, specifically relating to compliance and issues like that. We know the neighborhood school model favors wealthy students to those from low income and middle income families. And we know that the college system with its diversity quotas actually hurts the minority community, uh, specifically the African American community while giving an advantage to the Asian community. Uh, and when you add these things up, if you're in two of those demographics even, you're in really bad shape. But if you're you know, poor and a minority and a male, like you have had the, the deck stacked against you in a way. And I think that there's no way to improve schools without competition. I don't think that they have any incentive. And I've worked all over uh, from the South Bronx to Florida to Texas uh, and everywhere in between a little internationally. And it's the same thing over and over. So, that's so let's, let's chop it up. Um, so uh, my second doctorate is actually in um, higher education reform, specifically how it relates to Af African American uh, males and non traditional students in higher ed. And one of the dynamics that I researched was the reality of recruitment um, as well as maintaining that student inside of the institution. So we'll get into that in a moment. You said something that I thought was interesting in equity. You and I actually agree there's significant inequity in education. Let me first start with K through 12 education because there's a difference between K through 12 and then higher ed. 
So in K through 12 education, I would assume based on your proclamation that you believe charter schools, publicly funded charter schools are a good remedy for education inequity in a local community. Am I wrong to make that assumption? I wouldn't make that because it's a little broad, okay. especially because charter schools vary depending on the state yep. and they vary on how much freedom the they have. The, the example I'd use is KIPP used to be very uh, constructivist behavior. So they're doing something that was different than the public schools. But as we've gone down the path of standardized uh, in, uh, assessment, and I think you know this with the high stakes testing, uh, you get standardized instruction. And so if everybody is having to adhere to these bubble dot tests, and if everybody's funding models are the same, which is butts in seats till 1030, bubble dot tests and push every yeah. kid to college, they're all gonna end up emulating the same thing. So you do have some uh, places that do uh, a little more experimental. New York City is actually uh, where I used to work, allows for a lot more freedom uh, than some of the red states actually do. And, and that's, you know, that's not, that's just an honest assessment of it. Yeah, and let me say this brother, I'm not anti-choice. All right, yeah. so I don't like standardized testing. I think they are culturally biased. I do not think you should teach a student to a test. I think you should teach them to curriculum and to life. Um, I don't think our approach has benefited children. Uh, and you're right, we could use um, a different, let's say a different dynamic as it relates to education. But let's be very clear about some of the solutions presented by those on the conservative right. One of the solutions obviously has been publicly funded charter programs. I am very familiar with KIPP Academy. I have spoken at KIPP Academy graduations for years. I know KIPP Academy style a lot. Now, the reason why KIPP is able to do some things that public education cannot is because KIPP Academy, they get to choose what students they keep. They get to choose what students they decide to teach. And when you have a system that says, we're going to regulate who can actually become a student here and who does not, who will not be allowed to be a student, you're going to have a different educational outcome than let's say your traditional K through 12 public educational system, because they do not have that same choice. For example, KIPP, KIPP Academy can mandate parent participation. Mm -hmm. A regular public school is not able to mandate parent participation. If your parent does not participate, the student still has to be educated, dear brother. So that's one of the differences. Also, many of the outcomes that we're looking at that are academically based are not really connected to the educator, but connected to socioeconomic dynamics in that local community. For example, if you have a local community of young people who only eat, let's say 80% of that student population, they only eat a good meal one time a day, and that's at school. You're going to have some innate behavioral issues connected to diet or connected to hunger. And the school system, if they do not create a wraparound dynamic for the social economic atmosphere, you will see it play out in the academic arena. Once again, the school gets all of the blame for that when the reality is it is a social economic dynamic in that local community. Have I said anything you disagree with yet? Well, I guess my question would be, do you feel the schools can solve that? Because so far they haven't. And the other piece is, you're right, except I would extrapolate it further. Okay. Uh, we have full, we have school choice in this country, but it's only for the wealthy. And so we're denying this whole group of, of the majority and those in most need access to that education. So uh, KIPP should not be allowed to pick and choose any more than what I, what I would pertain to is when you have different variations, whether it's child savings accounts, vouchers, okay. whatever, I would I would want states to experiment with what's best and definitely cities for their populations. But you should have common standards of graduation. You should have common standards of admittance because that's where you get the bias. Right now, it's all economics, right? If yep. I have money, if I have access, then I get in. If I don't, well, I'm sorry, you're just out of luck. And so I would want to know what the metrics are that we're going to actually, you know, bridge that gap of socioeconomics because you're you're spot on and it's even worse than that. Like when I was in the, in the South Bronx and I have kids selling me, why should I finish school? This guy's offering me hat, cash money to stand out and sling on the corner. And I got four kids that, you know, my baby sister, my baby brother, all these people I got to take care of. My mom's already working, all this stuff. And it's it's a heartbreaking reality that they don't really prepare you for in college. And uh, there are all these different things that are impacting these students' lives. And that's why I'm saying we need more alternative education options and more options that, that go outside the mold, not like the traditionalist education approach. 
We're doing that. Why? We started that to avoid the Red Scare. We, we value math and science because of Sputnik. We do, you know, all these, the factory model, we got that in the late 1800s and we yeah. just, we're still ringing bells. Kids are so different and more diverse today. And this big monolith of one size fits all, and, and that's, this is my big pushback, can't react to those needs that you're talking about. You know, I tell my college students um, <clears throat> that the reason they sit in chairs that are in lines, in rows, is because the old concept of teaching was a very factory led dynamic. And they wanted to create individuals who all thought alike. And so I try to disrupt that kind of linear uh, thinking because I want disruption. I want you to become. Um, a conscientious disruptor as it relates to academics and uh, professional life and policy and politics. So I get your point on that. And, and we actually agree on taking out the bias approach to charter education. I think that's actually one of the greatest failures of charter education. And it's used to highlight their success is that they're able to legally discriminate. And when they can legally discriminate, they then give you numbers that seem based on contrast very different from the numbers of the K through 12 public school system. The problem with that design is that they get to pick and choose who comes to that charter system, which as you have said, typically the ones who have the money, the ones who have the support, the ones who are already doing well get to take advantage of that system. But here's the biggest issue, even bigger than that, Dr. Rogers, and I would love for you to answer it. The numbers, the math doesn't add up. The math does not add up. For example, let's say we have a school district, 10,000 students in the school district. You have publicly funded charter programs inside of that school district. That, that's called a parallel educational system. That parallel educational system takes money away from the existing budget of the already underfunded K through 12 public education, right? Here's the reality, brother, 100% of the students that need it can't take advantage of that system. So at best, you get 20% in the districts that do it at the best, which DC is one of them, New York is another. You're at 15 to 20% of capacity, meaning they don't have the budget, the infrastructure, the capacity, the ability to educate the vast majority of the students that are inside of the school system. So I present to you this question, if it's not a solution for all students, is it a solution for our students at all? That's my question to you. Okay, so in, in that theory, uh, if it, to answer it broadly, if you'll let me expand. No, if it only helps select students, then it is not a solution. And so my pushback is we do spend more uh, than any other country in the world on education. And we spend more per capita or per student, I'm sorry, uh, than any other major nation. Like the students that outspend us per student are, you know, small, uh, you know, Luxembourg and such. Uh, so we do have the funding. I would say that it just doesn't go to students and teachers. We spend almost 2 billion a year, as we just touched on, just on the testing, just mm -hmm. standardized testing per state. And that's not including test prep and things like that. The other thing I would add is, uh, where the funding goes is really important. And this is one of the things that, that I would argue is in the uh, the implicit curriculum, right? Yeah. So if you look at wealthy schools that I worked in, uh, the money is going into science labs and engineering programs and, and making sure that students have early reading access. When I worked in the inner cities, they, they send money to football programs. And I know I'm in Texas, I probably just lost half my votes. But probably <laughs> I like her, but we put money into football stadiums and basketball programs and other things. And there's a message you're sending different populations there with that funding. You are saying this group is supposed to be the engineers and the mathematicians and the scientists. And these are the entertainers, these are the gladiators back in Rome and, and they are to play our games and entertain us. And whether we think about that overt message, I'm telling you when you work and just like you have, and I know this, when you work with those kids one on one, they don't they pick up on that message. They know right. that the only way out of this poverty is through these means. So I don't think it's a matter of lack of funding. I think it is a matter of of improved funding is what I would say. I think we have the money. It's just got to go to the right places. But let's be honest about the hurdles that and the two biggest ones that I would say maybe three after more recent events. Uh, one is going to be uh, digital access in the inner city. So if you're offering all these alternative 
programs uh, in the inner city, we know that that Wi-Fi and all these things need to have. If you're going to tell kids to take school online, they've got to have access to, to online. The rural community, you're going to need better transportation, and that will cost money, and that will that's an investment we have to make. And then more broadly, I think school safety has to be 100% uh, streamlined across the board. It's 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 very much a system of have and haves nots right now. So yeah, and it st it still is, and that's one of the challenges. And I'm glad you're. You're not, you're not gaslighting, brother. You're telling the truth. One of the biggest issues is the fact that you still have this very biased way of selecting students and charter programs. There's absolutely no evidence nationally that charter systems are dramatically better. I'm gonna read some stats to you. And this is from the Center for Education Reform, which is a charter advocacy group. All right, they believe in charter education. The research they found from 15 states and District of Columbia. They studied 70% of the students enrolled in charter schools. They found that 17% of charters posted academic gains that were better than traditional public schools, 17%, keep that number in mind. 37%, however, of those charter schools, the students performed significantly worse, significantly worse at 37% of those charter schools, 46% had absolutely no change statistically whatsoever. Uh, and that's a published report. There's another dynamic from Education Next. And they published this and it was interesting. Charter school systems actually increase uh, racial inequity and racial segregation more so than public education. Dear brother, we already know public education is significantly uh, segregated in the United States of America because it's done by neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. But charter systems, according to the latest report from Education X, it increases that level of segregation even more so than the already very segregated public school system. And then the voucher program, which is another leg um, on this chair. The voucher program is interesting because, man, voucher programs are as different as a fingerprint when it comes to these communities that use them. But what you will find that's significant across the board with all of the voucher programs is that none of the voucher programs are able to be fully funded. None of them, they cannot be fully funded. Meaning the students that need it, the students that say we got to benefit from this voucher program, you would never be able to one, fully fund that student from top to bottom in that voucher program. The parents will still incur a significant cost and you cannot even touch the number of students that would qualify for this voucher program. Typically 5% is what a voucher program in a local community can cover. So once again, it's presented as a solution that can only impact a small minority of students. And even in that small minority, there's a built in cost that's typically unaffordable to those who are already living in poverty. I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, so I think the metrics should be simplified in this matter. Um, because you do make some strong points, but but what I, where I push back is that, that we get these metrics of test scores and, and college enrollment and all these things. The, the real metric is success and poverty, right? If, if a school is telling me that, oh yeah, it's an A school system, but it's it's a, been a one in five poverty rate for five generations. I'm sorry, it's not a good school. It's not an A school, okay? And the other piece I would say is that beyond the metrics, as far as spending, I would open up just beyond the charter schools and look at, you know, private schools, home schools, all these other ones, because the real metric is if the wealthy and the elite are able to choose and are able to go to these schools and they do, then that's what our poorest, that's what our most disadvantaged, that's what our most vulnerable should also have access okay. to. I agree, it has to be universal access. All right, and listen, I'm not anti-choice. I agree with you on much of the stuff you've said, not all of it. But once again, we're talking about an individual dynamic versus a policy dynamic. If you're telling me that the solution for an individual family is to give them a voucher, to have them go to another institution that is government funded. You're taking away money from an already underfunded system that desperately needs that money in order to survive. I don't see how that becomes your end all solution. To me, that's not even a band aid. To me, that actually creates a worse problem for the public educational systems. While maybe helping a family migrate to another school and based on the statistics are likely not to even succeed better in the other institution than the previous one based on the data. 
Well, I, I, the, the pushback there again, uh, Netflix didn't defund Blockbuster. We shouldn't <laughs> defund obsolescence. If the school's not working for that family, let that family get out. But there, again, there are hurdles. You have to get access and information to these families. So yeah. they're, they have a fair shot at choosing and knowing what they're getting. And then the big one is transparency. I think we have to have more transparency, openness, what's in the hidden curriculum, what's in the null curriculum, all these things that have been hidden from gate by gatekeepers for a long time. That's how you make good choices. Yeah, we both agree that standardized testing is a racket. Uh, we both agree that education K through 12 has to be reformed. I'm a reformist in education personally, and I agree uh, that you definitely submitted a good faith debate today, my friend. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, all right. Remember the conversation is next, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember the truth is always indisputable.